Hello everyone. Today we're going to talk about a few experiments relating to evolution that I find fascinating. So let's jump right in. <laughs> The last experimental evolution video featured a number of experiments elucidating how evolution works. There were experiments involving mutations, experiments with natural and sexual selection, and experiments with speciation. Today, we're looking at a random series of experiments involving evolution simply because I think they're cool. Here we go. The first experiment was performed in 1988 and is described in the paper tit-for-tat in sticklebacks and the evolution of cooperation. In sociobiology, one major question is how altruism can arise between individuals who are not related, or at least not closely related. Kin selection explains why parents would sacrifice themselves for their offspring or siblings for each other, and this relates to their shared genes. In diploid individuals, parents share half their DNA with their children, siblings share a fourth of their DNA with each other, and first cousins share an eighth of their DNA with each other. But why would individuals who do not share kinship help each other? As contradictory as it might sound, unrelated individuals will likely only help each other to help themselves. By one individual assisting a second, that second will therefore assist the first. This is called reciprocal altruism, a term coined in 1971 by American evolutionary biologist Robert Trivers. Reciprocal altruism is similar to a concept in game theory called tit-for-tat. The basic rules of tit-for-tat are that individual 1 assists individual 2 on the first turn. Then, individual 2 has the option to either assist or cheat individual 1. If individual 2 assists, then individual 1 will in turn assist, that is, individuals 1 and 2 reciprocate in assisting each other. However, if individual 2 cheats, then individual 1 will respond by cheating in turn. But if individual 2 assists again, then individual 1 will return to assisting. If both individuals know that there will only be one interaction, then it is manifestly better to cheat. However, if there is an unknown number of future interactions, then tit-for-tat is evolutionarily the best strategy. As you can see, this isn't altruism in the pure sense. It's altruism with the expectation of getting something in return. Selfish altruism. Although here, the players themselves often don't have a conscious expectation of a returned benefit of their altruistic behavior. Richard Dawkins goes into this concept at length in his famous 1976 book, The Selfish Gene. On the face of it, it seems rather simple that reciprocal altruism should evolve. But there is another stipulation. The cost of assisting another must not outweigh the benefits. For example, in some fish and birds, a few members of a school or flock will leave the safety of their group to gather information about a potential attacker. The cost is briefly increasing one's chance of being eaten, but the payoff is that once the individual is out of range, they are ultimately less likely to be eaten, now knowing the predator's movements. Individual fox sinus minnows will leave their shoal to gather information about stalking predators like pike. Three-spine sticklebacks have been known to do this too, which is why Manfred Malinsky picked them for an experiment. Sticklebacks will approach predators more closely when in groups of two or three. Both sticklebacks moving forward together is an instance of cooperation, whereas one staying back while the other moves forward is an act of cheating. To simulate this, Milinski partitioned a clear tank in two with a predatory tilapia in one half and a stickleback in the other. On one wall of the stickleback's tank was placed a mirror parallel to the glass. That way, if the stickleback moved forward, then it would see its mirror image also moving forward the same amount, the mirror image being the cooperating stickleback. A second experiment was run where the mirror was angled away slightly to give the appearance of the second stickleback not moving as far forward as the first, the mirror image being the cheating stickleback. The results were quite intriguing. According to the paper, quote, 
With the cooperating mirror, the sticklebacks were twice as often in the front half as with the defector mirror. With the cooperating mirror, the fish were found significantly more frequently in each of the three front quarters than in the experiment with the defecting mirror. With the defecting mirror, fish were found more often in the back quarter of the tank than in the experiment with the cooperating mirror. Close quote. So the sticklebacks not only got closer to the tilapia, but they spent more time closer to the tilapia when they thought they had a cooperator. This is fully in line with the reciprocal altruism thesis. For the second experiment, fast forward to 1995 to a paper titled Induction of Ectopic Eyes by Targeted Expression of the Eyeless Gene in Drosophila. Since 1915, researchers have been aware of a gene in Drosophila called eyeless. Eyeless encodes a transcription factor that regulates the expression of other genes involved in the morphogenesis of eyes. When eyeless is knocked out by a mutation, the fruit fly fails to form eyes. Hence, the gene is named for what happens when something goes wrong with it. Homologs of this gene have been identified in various bilaterians from mice to mollusks, and its other well-known name is Pax6. Now, Eyeless shares a very high amount of sequence similarity with our homolog of it. According to that 1995 paper, quote, The proteins encoded by these genes share 94% sequence identity in the paired domain and 90% identity in the homeo domain, and they contain additional similarities in the flanking sequences. Furthermore, two out of three splice sites in the paired box and one out of two splice sites in the homeo box are conserved between the Drosophila and the mammalian genes, which indicates that these genes are orthologous, close quote. For reference, paired domains and homeodomains are the parts of the transcription factor that bind to DNA, functioning as repressors or activators. Additionally, the mouse and fly genes have similar expression patterns during development. At the time of the experiment, the researchers were attempting to determine the genetic reach, so to speak, of Eyeless. How many genes were under its control? How much morphology did it affect on its own? To test this, the researchers came up with the hypothesis. Quote, If, however, eyeless is the master control gene for eye morphogenesis, the ectopic expression of eyeless should induce the formation of ectopic eye structures in other parts of the body, similar to the transformations obtained for antennapedia and other homeotic genes. Close quote. To accomplish this, the researchers used, oddly enough, a yeast transcription factor called GAL4. The transcription of GAL4 will, in turn, transcribe any target gene so long as the target gene is preceded by an upstream activating sequence that consists of five GAL4 binding sites. The way this works is that GAL4 is inserted at random sites via transposition in the fly genome, and if it lands near a specific enhancer, then the enhancer triggers GAL4 to be transcribed. When this occurs, the GAL4 protein then activates transcription of the target gene bound to the upstream activating sequence. So, the researchers attached eyeless to that upstream activating sequence with the GAL4 specific binding sites and bred flies that had this whole gene complex in their genome. The researchers also bred independent lines of flies possessing the GAL4 enhancer. And then they crossed the two lines of flies. So, whenever GAL4 happened to land near a GAL4 enhancer, GAL4 was transcribed, and that caused the target gene, eyeless, to be transcribed in turn. Of the 20 lines the researchers created, only three produced viable adult flies. These flies had ectopic eyes on the wings, legs, antennae, and haltiers. In fact, 100% of the flies produced ectopic eyes. According to the paper, quote, microscopic analysis of sections of ectopic eye structures indicated that the ectopic omatidia consisted of the full complement of the different types of cells and structures. In a longitudinal section of an antennal ectopic eye, we were able to distinguish cornea, pseudocone, cone cells, primary, secondary, and tertiary pigment cells, and photoreceptors with rhabdomeres, close quote. Thus, eyeless is indeed the master control, as its activation, regardless of location, produces normal eye morphogenesis. 
The researchers also took this experiment a step further. They produced lines of flies with the mouse homologue of eyeless and got similar results. But instead of the flies producing mouse eyes, they produced fly eyes. Despite mice and flies sharing a common ancestor that lived some 600 million years ago, their hox genes have been conserved, indicating their importance. Let's jump again, but this time to 2014. Emily Standen and colleagues authored a paper titled Developmental Plasticity and the Origin of Tetrapods. Some 400 million years ago, a group of Sarcopterygian fish, also known as lobe-finned fish, made the transition to land. Actinopterygians, also known as the ray-finned fish, and Sarcopterygians split in the Silurian, and Sarcopterygians radiated in the Devonian. This produced a variety of lineages, like the coelacanths, lungfish, osteolepiforms, and, eventually, the tetrapodomorphs. We already know that lungfish can spend some time on land wrapped in their protective cocoons, but the extent to which other Sarcopterygians spent time on land is pretty much unknown. Probably, many Sarcopterygians could spend a little time on land, and tetrapods represent the lineage that shifted its niche to totally terrestrial. In this paper, the researchers wondered whether phenotypic plasticity played a role in the evolution of tetrapods. We have talked about phenotypic plasticity before on this channel in our video The Italian Wall Lizard. In essence, the environment can induce changes in the phenotype and under certain conditions, alleles that allow for a particular range of phenotypes could be naturally selected. Over generations, this range could be whittled down until only a select few phenotypes remain and become fixed in the population. As there are no Elpistostegids around today to directly test, the researchers picked what they consider a good analogue, the Bashir polypterus. Bashirs are the most basally derived extant actinopterygians, and the authors write, quote, Polypterus has an elongate body form, rhomboid scales, ventrolaterally positioned pectoral fins, and functional lungs, all traits that are comparable to Elpistostegid fishes. Moreover, this living fish is capable of surviving on land and can perform tetrapod-like terrestrial locomotion with its pectoral fins." Close quote. For this experiment, the researchers raised two groups of Bashirs, one raised in water and one raised on land. The land-raised Bashirs had a number of phenotypic changes. For one thing, their clavicles were narrower and more elongated, and their cross-sections were thinner. According to the paper, quote, terrestrialized polypterists displayed less variable walking behavior, planted their pectoral fins closer to their body midlines, lifted their heads higher, and had less fin slip, allowing more effective vaulting of the anterior body over the planted fin, close quote. Further, quote, the skeletal changes seen in the treatment group fish revealed a marked reduction in the external boundaries of the opercular cavity, bounded by the supraclithrum and clithrum, which presumably facilitates greater flexibility between the pectoral girdle and the operculum, similar to what is observed in stem tetrapods such as Eusthenopteron. Close quote. Thus, simply by raising Bashirs in a different environment, they exhibited features like those of stem tetrapods. A similar process could have occurred 400 million years ago, leading ultimately to the emergence of tetrapods. The final experiment we are going to investigate was published this year. G. Ozen Bosdag et al. published an article titled De Novo Evolution of Macroscopic Multicellularity. We've talked about multicellularity experiments in the past. See our video, Misunderstanding Multicellularity, for more information. This study writes, quote, Indeed, while prior work with yeast and algae have shown that novel multicellularity is relatively easy to evolve in vitro, these organisms remain microscopic, typically growing to a maximum size of tens of to hundreds of cells, close quote. The researchers, however, wanted to understand the genetic elements involved in transitioning not just to multicellularity, but to macroscopic multicellularity. The researchers began their experiment by first deleting the ACE2 open reading frame, which allowed all the populations to become multicellular. The researchers also generated five replicate populations that were incapable of aerobic respiration, so five populations were anaerobic, five were aerobic, and five could switch back and forth. Only the anaerobic populations achieved macroscopic sizes, in line with earlier hypotheses that, quote, 
Oxygen is a double-edged sword. While it provides significant metabolic advantages, selection for efficient use of this resource may paradoxically suppress the evolution of macroscopic multicellular organisms." Close quote. The researchers then evolved all 15 populations for more than 600 rounds of growth and selection, which is equivalent to over 3,000 generations. Similar to the yeast experiment we discussed in Experimental Evolution Part 1, the researchers selected their yeast by only allowing the yeast that settled out fastest in the tubes to propagate. This selected for increasing size. The anaerobic cluster sizes increased in diameter from 32 micrometers to 868 micrometers, or from about 100 cells to about 450,000 cells. According to the paper, quote, the largest clusters of 600-day evolved snowflake yeast are over a millimeter in diameter, which is comparable to the size of an adult Drosophila, close quote. The evolution of size in the anaerobic populations seems to have proceeded via two major steps. First, the clusters doubled in radius, and then they entered a period of stasis for 50 to 250 rounds before rapidly increasing in size. Cells elongated over the generations, more than doubling their length. Previous work had indicated that as cells elongated, their clusters became less packed with cells, thereby reducing cell-to-cell -cell collisions. As a result, the researchers generated mathematical models that predicted as the cells elongated, the clusters would become progressively less packed. And this held true only to an extent. After a certain point, clusters with elongate cells dramatically increased in density, contrary to model expectations. However, this suggested that the lineages evolved novel biophysical adaptations for increased multicellular toughness. The researchers wondered whether the clusters had become adhesive, sticking to each other. However, staining the cells revealed that this was not the case. The paper concludes, quote, Flock-like aggregation does not explain the evolution of macroscopic size in snowflake yeast, close quote. The researchers were surprised to find that even though the clusters were clonal, they were not totally connected. Even when breaks occurred, the cells were entangled together. The researchers write, quote, Entanglement both enables separate branches within macroscopic snowflake yeast to stay together and allow them to endure the large stresses necessary for growth to macroscopic size, close quote. The researchers then did something really interesting. They sequenced the genomes of the anaerobic strains. The researchers found that the ratio of non-synonymous to synonymous mutations was greater than 1 in 4 of the 5 populations, indicating that adaptive evolution had occurred. Genes known to affect cell cycle progression, filamentous growth, and bud scar size were mutated in the 5 populations, demonstrating parallel evolution. Simple mutations in a few key genes allowed the yeast to reach much greater sizes than their unicellular ancestors. This occurred in just 600 days. Imagine how many lineages have made the transition from unicellular to multicellular in Earth's history. It therefore comes as no surprise that over 20 independently multicellular clades exist today. In closing, those are some evolutionary experiments that I find interesting. They elucidate aspects of evolution from how reciprocal altruism to Hox genes work to the evolution of terrestriality and macroscopic multicellularity. Given how our knowledge of biology increases along with our technological capabilities, who knows what other evolutionary experiments will be performed in future years. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.